Good evening. My name is Dave Davis. I'm the pastor here at Nassau Church, one of the pastors, and I am uh, happy on behalf of the session and on behalf of the congregation to welcome all of you here for this uh, for this this event. Uh, it's a privilege for us to join together with two of our institutional partners, Princeton Theological Seminary and the Presbyterian Historical Society. And fitting that we would gather here in the heart of Presbyterian history. And I will um, remind you that one of my predecessors was John Witherspoon, <laughs> a pastor of First Presbyterian Church uh, a long, long time ago. And on the university campus, on the other side of near the library, there's a beautiful, beautiful statue of John Witherspoon. It lists him, identifies him as a clergy, Presbyterian clergy person. He likes to say pastor of the church right across, the, right around the corner. We welcome you. The, the, um, the sanctuary is open. If, if you would like to take a look uh, at the conclusion of the evening, we're very pleased to share our, um, our major renovations in this building, this room and the sanctuary and bathrooms. And the bathrooms are right out outside to the right if you need them. If you go out there to the right, uh, you'll find the bathrooms as well. I have the privilege of introducing to you uh, Nancy Taylor, who is the Director of Programs and Services at the Presbyterian Historical Society in Philadelphia. She's been there for 16 years. Uh, she is a certified archivist, holds degrees from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the University of Texas at Austin, together with Professor James Moorhead, a member here at uh, Nassau. They are co-editors of the Journal for Presbyterian the Journal of Presbyterian History. And if you've ever had a chance to, uh, to visit the Philadelphia offices and the center there for the Historical Society, Nancy is a great tour guide, which I can speak to from personal experience. So Nancy, welcome to Nassau Church. Thank you so much to NASA and to Princeton Theological Seminary for partnering with us for this event. Um, we are very appreciative of that support and that assistance. I want to recognize some people here tonight that help us do our mission. Um, we have some board members here, including Ellen Clark Claymo, Paul McCray, Shirley Satterfield, who's not here yet, but is a member at Witherspoon Street Presbyterian Church here in Princeton. Um, some volunteers, Al and Maya Kamerling, who are members here at NASA, um, and Dave Goodale. Thank you so much for all of your support. And we also have other supporters here, and we are very grateful that you could make it tonight, and we like to see that there's some new friends here, too. Um, we have three staff members here, including, um, in addition to myself, um, Sam Piccolo, Dina Stewart, and Fred Tangerman, who's videoing over there in the corner. So thank you to everyone. Um, I hope that most of you have at least heard of us before. Um, we are located in Philadelphia, right down in Center City, um, just several blocks from the Liberty Bell Independence Hall complex. And we're open to the public. You can come in and do research there. We do give tours, as Dave said. So um, if you are ever in Philadelphia, you want to do research or come in and do a tour, just contact us and let us know. You'll get the, the behind the scenes treatment um, with the tours. Um, we like to show off our building and our collections. We um, have a website, so I know that you've got some literature, but if you want to see more about some of our collections, learn more about um, our services that we do for the Presbyterian Church USA, I urge you to visit our website. We are the National Archives of the Presbyterian Church USA, and um, we have been in, in existence for over 160 years, so you can imagine how much material that we have um, over that time. But we are a national archive, so just because we're located in Philadelphia, um, we, our collections really span the whole country and the world with all of the world mission work that Presbyterians have done. 
So we are really very blessed to have Craig Barnes speak um, to you tonight. He, as I hope you know, is the current president of Princeton Theological Seminary, and he started in that position in 2013. For the 10 years before that, he was professor of ministry and leadership at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, and he was also the senior pastor during that time at Shadyside Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh. He has also served pastorates at National Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C., at Christ Presbyterian Church in Madison, Wisconsin, and at First Presbyterian Church in Colorado Springs, Colorado. He earned his Ph.D. in 1992 in the history of Christianity from the University of Chicago. And his dissertation looked focused on John R. Mott, who right at the turn of the 20th century for about 25 years was the general secretary of the World Student Christian Federation. And he also was very instrumental in the formation of the World Council of Churches. Dr. Barnes is the author of numerous books and articles. Um, one of his mo more recent books is Body and Soul, Reclaiming the Heidelberg Catechism, which just has been, a new version has been adopted into the Book of Confessions. Um, Dr. Barnes is going to speak tonight on Puritans, Rationalists, and the Presbyterian Church. And please join me in welcoming, welcoming him. Dave, I have a Witherspoon statue story of my, of my own. <laughs> when I was at the church in Washington, D.C., I discovered that uh, I was making my way downtown. It was about two blocks south of DuPont Circle. I bumped into John Witherspoon okay. um, right by the side of the street. Um, I thought this would be an odd place to see a large statue of John Witherspoon. And as it turns out, that's uh, where First Presbyterian Church used to be. Uh, and so they had the statue of Witherspoon right in front of them. Uh, in front of the church. And then, uh, due to a number of, of issues, the First Presbyterian Church decided to join with Covenant Presbyterian Church. And this is the nature of Presbyterians in negotiation. They decided the only way they could make this work is if they sold both buildings and changed the name uh, to the National Presbyterian Church. And so then they moved to another part of town, and uh, as they were getting ready to take the statue with them, the city said, no, thank you, we'll, we'll keep it right here. <laughs> <laughs> then they widened the street <laughs> substantially. So uh, <laughs> next time you're on your way to D.C., stop by and uh, but be careful because uh, you can actually, he'll clip off the, your side view mirror. He's so close, <laughs> so close to the street there. And, and maybe, you know, given affairs in D.C., it's, you know, we need all the help we can get, and, and maybe John will help out a bit. <laughs> Uh, far be it from me uh, to lecture to the Presbyterian Historical Society on Presbyterianism. My hunch is pretty much everybody in the room knows as much as I do about Presbyterianism. Uh, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, what I am going to do is talk about the environment into which Presbyterian arrived in this country and how it affected and shaped it and uh, some of the ways that it became significantly different than uh, the Presbyterianism of the mother churches uh, that sent it over here. So that's what I want to look at. That's my theme. And we'll, I'll try to illustrate the point as we go along. The thesis that I want to present to you tonight is that um, we really have two mothers to Protestantism in this country. And some of our confusion about our agenda is because we have two different mothers. And you can imagine being raised by two mothers, at times you would get a little confused. And, uh, but that's the case for, for religion in America, especially the, the Protestant variety. There are, there's the Puritan mother, uh, which is very formative, still to this day in our self-understanding whether we want to associate with Puritans or not, we're all dramatically impacted by their influence upon us. And there's the rationalist influence, or we could call it Republican influence. I didn't put that in the title because I was afraid I would lose all the Democrats. <laughs> But obviously when I use the term, I'm going to use it a, quite a bit in, in a few minutes. I'm not referring to the political party. I'm referring to the founders of the, of the country, those who wrote the Constitution, those who believed uh, deeply in representative government, that notion of <coughs> republicanism. So let me start first uh, by talking about uh, the Puritans. In order to understand the Puritans in, the, in America, we need to get kind of a running jump to that. So let me go back to English Puritanism. There are uh, a couple of things 
that help provide windows into understanding of, of Puritanism. And when the Puritans came to New England, they brought these with them. One is the pilgrimage. Uh, this is core to the spirituality of uh, Puritan thinking. Uh, we have, we know a lot about Puritans because they were big journal keepers. These are the people who actually started journaling. Anytime I talk to a seminarian who's discovered this whole new spiritual discipline called journaling, <laughs> like, oh no, this, we've had this for a while. Um, and as they would describe their, their pilgrimage, it, it, it was always kind of a, uh, uh, a standardized narrative. They talked a lot about the upward climb. They talked about the warfare, the spiritual warfare. Uh, they talked about um, not getting stuck along the way. What would be a, the classic literary illustration of this? Pilgrim's Progress. Thank you, Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, and these, as you read these journals, you get more and more of a sense of that. The pilgrimage doesn't start, though, until there's a conversion experience. And to have this conversion experience, you would, you would come and you would describe your conversion experience to the elders who would affirm that. And sometimes this conversion experience was fraught with anxiety and self-doubt and uh, periods of darkness before the conversion comes in the period of relief. And then you began the upward climb. That's true in Puritan thinking, not only for the individual, but for society itself. Um, and there's a search for through the traumas of society to find a conversionary experience of all society and then to begin their way also as a social uh, group up through the upper climb. And the English Puritans were hoping to fulfill this dream in England itself. And the image that they kept referring to uh, in their search for that is New Jerusalem. Um, pilgrims love Old Testament imagery and they love to invoke that in a search for a holy commonwealth of England. And uh, they felt not just that this was a political agenda or an ought to, or even just a, um, a, um, a, a right thing to do, they had a covenantal responsibility from God. You couldn't have experienced authentic conversion without believing that you had a responsibility to not just convert your life, but all of England to be this new Jerusalem, this new holy commonwealth. So when people think of Puritans as being world-denying, nothing could be further from the truth. They're absolutely devoted to transforming the world, and they have a responsibility from God to do exactly that. Even after the failure of these aspirations with the Cromwellian Revolution and the restoration of the monarchy, the Puritans didn't all go away. They didn't like say, oh, shucks, we gave it our best shot. Uh, it started to go different directions after the restoration of the monarchy. Some continued to hope for another, another effort, another try at that. Many Puritans in England started to be even referred to as uh, uh, Presbyterians because of their devotion to the Westminster Confession and, and how similar they seemed to be to what was going on up in Scotland. But you can basically divide them between separating and not separating uh, Puritans. The non-separating ones were the ones who said, uh, we're going to stay here to the bitter end. We're going to just keep praying for the, the uh, Holy Commonwealth, the New Jerusalem here. Others felt some pressure to leave, or maybe they participated in that themselves uh, with their own aspirations to leave, and these are the people who were the separating, and they eventually the ones who led the way in making their way to the New England. Um, they view themselves as the called out. Notice the, this image. We have even the journals of those who were on the Mayflower coming over. They talk about passing through the waters, uh, making their way to a new land, driving out the Canaanites, establishing the new and holy Jerusalem, all as an act of worship and glory to God. The pilgrims are the people that we have the most uh, kind of sentimental attachment to, but they're actually a pretty small piece of the Puritan story. They don't actually last that long. The way in which Puritanism gets inculcated into New England is through the Massachusetts Bay Colony. These are the Puritans who came over, not because they were fleeing something, but they came over for economic interest. And there was, there was, there was, there was, there was money to be made in New England. But they brought with them their Puritan theology. And the things that we know about them is that they, um, they're settled, they're clear, they're going to make this thing work, unlike the pilgrims. Um, 
but they have a clear understanding of relationship to the church and the society around it. So the kingdom, the, you know, the New Jerusalem, is the church. And this church stands in relationship to the land. And the church's responsibility to the land is to go out and subdue it, um, evangelize it, convert it, change it, make it a part of the church so that the, so that the circle of the church will keep getting larger and larger and larger. Again, because this is what God has told them to do. There's no rationality behind it. There was no, uh, you know, it wasn't like they came together and said, okay, we should take over the whole place. It, was, it had come to them from God. Uh, as a mandate, uh, and in order to receive the grace from God, they had to respond to God in a sense of mission to the whole land. And so whether they were uh, trying to convert uh, Native Americans or whether they were trying to convert others who had come over for economic interests were, were, but were not a part of the church, it didn't matter, you left church as a part of the New Jerusalem, as a part of the Christian community, the body of Christ, and you went out to convert these people. Clear sense of mission. That worked for a little while. Here's their problem. The Puritans is one of the primary ways in which Reformed theology entered this country. They're Calvinists. So as Calvinists, they baptize their babies. So think about the problem here. What do you, and what do, you do with a baptized baby when you have a theology that says you have to have had a conversion experience to get into the church. So until you've had your conversion experience and have explained that to the elders, you're not a member of the church. So what happens to those who've been baptized as infants, as good Calvinists will do, and yet they haven't had a conversion experience? Where do they belong in this, this little circle? Are they in the church? No, they haven't had a conversion experience. Are they out of the church and out here where the unconverted are? Well, yeah, but they've been baptized. So this creates a real dilemma for them. The way they respond to that is what historians later began to call the halfway covenant. And the halfway covenant is right here between this. And this is where the baptized infants belong. They're not out here where the heathen are. They're not out here where the true members of the church are that are baptized and had a conversionary experience. They're in the middle. But watch what happens in terms of the church's relationship to society once they do that. Once they set up the halfway covenant, the goal then is for people, for these baptized babies, to move here, right? So what happens is that the arrow inverts. Now, the missional agenda is to get those who are out there into the church. Whereas previously it was to expand the borders of the church, now the agenda is you want those who are as far range out as possible to come in. You even want those who are baptized, unconverted, to take the next step. That then leads to the next assumption of New England of Puritanism, which is that we're always preaching to the unconverted, even within our own pews. Because you'll have people going to church who aren't here. They're here. They're at this halfway spot. You may have people who are here who are kind of on their way into the church. But you can see the tremendous significance of, of that shift in the arrows from where we're going out, trying to expand the walls of the church, to now inviting people deeper and deeper into the church. It's a, it's a completely different agenda. That also then um, assumes that the church is something you join as a choice. Whereas before, when we had the circle going out, the church was doing anything it could get, could do to get people into the church, including um, uh, military action. Now you choose your way into the church because you can't have a conversion experience apart from ch choice. So the church has all of a sudden become a voluntary society. That assumes a disestablished church. I'm going to get back to that in a minute. But you can't have this model of mission without having a, a clear assumption that the church is not established because people are making choices. Uh, uh, you know, part of the faith is, is, is preferential. It also then leads to revivalism. Uh, and the first, this just provides the perfect theological framework for the first great awakening. 
if the assumption is you're always preaching to the unconverted, I mean, it's at least some of them are unconverted, not all of you, but some of them are unconverted, then they're always, then that sets up the, again, again the theological missional foundation for the Great Awakening with people like Jonathan Edwards who are, who are calling people who've been coming to church to actually have a true encounter with God because you want people to get closer and closer to this, this clear center. I'm racing through this stuff because I don't have a lot of time, so I gotta get to the rationalists. <laughs> Anybody lost? <laughs> Want to keep going? This is one of the main uh, paradigms for understanding church in, in America from the very beginning. We have a covenantal responsibility. The church is a voluntary association. People have to make choices to, to go to come in and be a part of this church. Church periodically needs to go through renewal movements for its sake of its own vitality and its own energy. And as it goes through these renewal movements, it finds its own life. That's what revivalism was, but there are other forms of renewal movements as well. And the church believes all this because God told them to do that. God gave them this covenant. Just as God gave the Hebrews the promised land, God gave the Puritans this land, and they have a responsibility to God for this land. That's one primary means. Here's, here's another mother. And this would be uh, the rationalists. The, um, the framers of the Constitution um, had a dilemma when they began to write uh, the, uh, the Constitution. That dilemma was, at the time, established religion was the norm. Um, disestablishing religion in our country was what Sidney Mead calls a lively experiment that history had not seen before. And the reason for that is, up to this time in history, we couldn't imagine how a political leader could hold the people together without harnessing their religious values. Because religious values are ultimate values. And how can you govern a people if you don't have control of their ultimate values? So sometimes you would have um, the leader himself or herself be uh, deified. Sometimes you would have the leader uh, have um, the head of the church as an auxiliary to his or her own uh, administration. Um, even the reformers couldn't imagine how, how you could hold the country together unless everybody was of the same faith. So if you were in Germany during the Reformation, you eventually became Lutheran. Nobody asked you to become Lutheran. You didn't go to a class for that. You, you were German, so you were Lutheran. And if you were Swiss, you were Reformed. And if you were Rome, you were Catholic. I mean, the, these, these were just the norms of the day. This is how you hold the people together through the state church. But imagine that the Revolutionary War is over and you're Jefferson or Franklin or Hamilton or whatever and you're trying to put together your new country and someone brings up the question of what will the church be? Well, what are you going to choose? Um, how, how, would you, how would you even make that choice? Um, the, uh, Puritans now soon become Congregationalists have New England. Uh, there's some Reformed folks going on in New York. Uh, there's some Presbyterians and Anglicans around Virginia. The Methodists and eventually the Baptists uh, will have this, much of the South. The Catholics own Maryland. Um, and so which of these churches will you choose for your state church? No matter which one they chose, they're going to leave out others. And the Republicans had seen the horrors of the Thirty Year War. They knew all about that. They didn't want to have just completed a horrible war of independence, pick a church, make it the state church, and then immediately create wars within the colonies themselves over, over these religious divisions. So they were stuck. There was a practical problem. There's also an intellectual problem for them. These men were heavily influenced by the Enlightenment. And they're not particularly um, overwhelmed by the claims to supernatural revelation of any of these churches. Uh, they believe um, in rationality. They believe in uh, what can be discerned through common sense experience. How do they begin the Declaration of Independence? We hold these truths to be what? Self-evident. When the English try to do this, same thing they talked about, Almighty God has revealed. That's not our language. 
<coughs> we know these truths to be self-evident. Anybody can tell these truths just by paying attention. So, um, with a commitment to reason and rationality, um, and uh, the autonomy of the mind, they pulled together uh, what they actually had to do, what they intellectually wanted to do anyway, which was to put the First Amendment into the Constitution, claiming that Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The reason they did that was because they were totally rejecting the notion of a state church. Established religion or state churches assume two things. One, they assume that, as I said before, you have to have commonly held religious values for the society to hold together. You have to have commonly held religious values for the society to hold. And secondly, the state has the right to coerce these religious values. So what they do, using the principles of autonomy and reason, they reject that second principle about coercion. That's what the First Amendment does. There cannot be any coercion of religion or against religion. But they kept the first principle, that a society does have to have commonly held religious values. They did believe that. And the reason that they believed that is because they were very concerned not only about uh, reason, um, and, uh, but also about civic virtue. And they thought that religion was in fact necessary for virtue, and that all of the religions in the colonies produced this, this virtue. They realized that there were differences between Baptists and Catholics and Anglicans and Congregationalists. But they called those differences inessential. Everything that was essential for holding the Republic together, all of these religions were provided. That's why they could get away, at least within their own minds, with the First Amendment. They still got virtue because a good Catholic and a good Presbyterian are both going to make good citizens. So that's why they said we don't need to establish it. Why don't they all do what we need? We just need to get rid of this principle of coercion. Here are some of the problems of the legacy as we have inherited, though. Um, the framers of the Constitution can call the things that distinguish a Catholic from a Presbyterian inessential. But they're not inessential to the Catholic or the Presbyterian. <laughs> There's a reason why a Catholic's a Catholic and a Presbyterian's a Presbyterian. And um, so it never really sat that well with, um, it never sat that well with the various churches. Some would even go all the way back here to find the roots of secularism. If you say that all of these religions or religious traditions are preferential, like you choose to be that, or you don't have to be that, or you can be in that, it's not, it's not required by the state for you to be a Presbyterian or a Lutheran. <coughs> if you say it's preferential, then it's only one more step to say religion itself is preferential. And this and the society can hold together without even that first principle of saying all religions are necessary for virtue. Because some would say we were on a slippery slope as soon as we made. Uh, all the different churches preferential. If, if that's preferential, then I don't need any church at all. And then, lo and behold, as we got rid of even the first principle of established religion, we discovered that, in fact, actually, yes, society can hold together uh, without uh, religious people uh, creating virtue. There are other sources of virtue besides religion. At least that is the claim. Here's another one of the conflicts that come as a result of this. These people over here, believed um, that they had, as I said before, this covenantal responsibility to the land. Um, and it, it was um, not because, again, they had won a contest for it. It's not because they, um, they figured out this makes sense. It's because God told them. God told them to set up the new Jerusalem here. So Puritans, and by their nature, and even to this day, whether, I mean, there are Lutheran Puritans and Baptist Puritans and certainly Catholic Puritans as well in terms of the American phenomenon. 
for a Puritan to pull the political realm out of the comprehensive ideals of their religion is to say their religion can't be comprehensive. All the religion is comprehensive for all. For a, the way Puritan think has trickled down to us, if you say Jesus is Lord, you're not saying he's just my Lord, and you can have your Lord, you can have your Lord. That's, a, a, that's, not, a, that's not most people's understanding of Lordship. It's certainly not the Puritan understanding of Lordship. If you say Jesus is Lord, that's a comprehensive statement. Lord over all. <clears throat> and yet, because of the First Amendment, and this need for a more rational approach to understanding how we will pursue public policy, even if the Puritan mentality succeeded, at that point, we would be violating the Constitution. Because you can't establish your comprehensive ideal. So you're saying you can have comprehensive ideals for everything except the political realm. Now, the framers of the Constitution didn't ever really get that part of it. They thought that what would happen is that they would knew all these various churches were out there. They would all come together with representatives, uh, the Republican representatives. They would come to Washington, D.C. They would all have whatever convictions they had about the public good. They would enter into public debate. That's what they believed in. These people believe in covenant. These people believe in debate. They would enter into the public debate, and through public debate, the public good would emerge. And that's how we would pursue public policy. That's at least the way this whole thing is set up. Um, that's how we would discern truth. This is a very rational, pro debate is a rational process, <laughs> well, unless you're talking to my 16-year-old. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's supposed to be set up as a rational process. That through the rationality of, of, of debate and deliberation, we will figure out the right way to go. These people don't care about debate. How can you debate with somebody when God has already told them what to do? So let's say, for example, uh, the abortion issue. When we were debating that, uh, and the courts were debating that, and the, 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 the rationalist approach to our faith said, well, through this deliberative process, we'll figure out the truth, and therefore, at least the best way to go ahead. But even if you lose the debate, if you're on this side of your two mothers, you're going to say, that doesn't mean that we were wrong just because we've lost the debate. That just means we've lost the debate. We're going to try again and again and again, because I know I'm right, because the Bible tells me so, or God tells me so, or my community tells me so. So what, what this precludes is the ultimate success of the, of the New Jerusalem. You, the New Jerusalem can't fundamentally succeed here. <coughs> um, because this won't let it happen. And yet, this can't stop trying and be true to itself. It's called mission. I and mean, you just have to keep after the mission and keep after it, keep after it, keep after it. But this pulls their success, pulls from their success, the political realm. And yet, if any of them did succeed, then that would mean the establishment of the religion. <coughs> um, let me look quickly at how this shows up in the early days of uh, Princeton. Um, this is where Witherspoon hangs out mostly. <coughs> He's uh, very committed to common sense realism. He's, um, as he establishes the college in New Jersey, he sets up uh, kind of a, a moral philosophy as the basis of the curriculum. By moral philosophy, what he means is that um, there's a, kind of an empirical sense of obligation, of right, and of truth, which is available to all people simply through careful attention to the human consciousness. Not a word in there about supernatural revelation. <coughs> By contrast, Miller is over here. Miller was raised in Boston uh, from a father who was trained uh, in ministry by Congregationalists. They became Presbyterians, but in, in, there was a very thin line between Presbyterianism and Congregationalism in New England in these days. And uh, when you read Miller's story of his call to ministry, it sure sounds like a conversion story. He talks about his anxiety. He talks about having to accept the Savior as his hope and his life. And at the point of that conversion, then he has a, not only a conversion, but a sense of a call uh, into his own ministry. 
And Miller has always a real sense of mission. Even when he was here, uh, uh, he had a tremendous sense of mission. And his wife set up a Sunday school class for colored children. I mean, he, they really were committed to what they ought to do in order to do what, <coughs> whatever approximation they could get of the, um, of the, of the New Jerusalem. The really interesting guy is um, Alexander. Because he's a blend uh, of both of these people. Um, he uh, was raised in Virginia. Uh, his father chose him for an academic life. He uh, studied at a school in the South which was built on the curriculum of the College of New Jersey. Uh, when he Developed um, enough training, his father sent him out to the frontier, which was, um, I hope that had been somewhere near the middle of Virginia, I think. Um, and as he worked with a large family there, uh, tutoring their children, um, the woman of that family got quite caught up with the Baptist, and at, after the first great awakening, the Baptist started. Uh, making their way south, and they just kind of flooded Virginia. And so there's a constant call to conversion that uh, Alexander was caught up with. And when you read uh, narratives of his early life, I mean, he's, he's in great uh, anxiety about the state of his soul, and at one point just gives up to say, the only thing that makes sense is for me to be damned. And there's a story of him rolling on the ground in anxiety. He's not really sure he's saved. And someone asks him if he's been born again. He says, I, I don't really know. He says, well, you must not be because you would know if you are. And this wasn't very helpful to Alexander. <laughs> and so he uh, continues to wrestle with this. And this, I am, I'm not, I am, I am. Until then, finally, he gives up the need for a psychological confirmation and um, returns to a more calm, objective reality of the grace of God in this life. Uh, which is just obvious, and some of the uh, pastor, Presbyterian pastor friends around him get him, kind of get him back uh, into this kind of thinking. So he really is a crossover between, between both of those. So you, you see even in the early, early days of Presbyterianism here, how each of our own founders were affected by this in various ways. We're going to get some questions in a minute, but I want to, I want to keep rolling. So let me get back to this dilemma of um, how do we get, how do we handle the challenge of all of these churches have a covenantal responsibility to the land. They all want to succeed. They all want to have a sense of mission. And yet none of them can ever fully succeed. And they're all prevented from actually establishing the New Jerusalem. Uh, historians have argued back and forth on this uh, quite a while. So, uh, who, who, which one is most dominant? The two, when I was in grad school, the two Sydneys kind of led the way. Sidney Allstrom at Yale would keep talking about how dominated Americans are by Puritans. And that's the fundamental religious paradigm for all religious uh, experiences in this country. Sidney Mead, who wrote The Lively Experiment, says this is the primary uh, dominant experience. Mm -hmm. That you can't just say God told you, and we are a uh, nation which we have to engage in deliberation. We never really know uh, maybe providentially it will work out. I mean, he just kept trumpeting that famous story of uh, Abraham Lincoln, who received the letter, remember, uh, from the pastor in the north saying, surely God will give you the victory over the south. And in response, Lincoln says, you know, how do we know who's, who's right? It doesn't make any sense to us that it would be God's will uh, for uh, you know, th this horrible war or for slavery. But we can't say that we know God's will. He felt that through the conflict, the will of God would emerge. That's all it is. Through the conflict, the will of God will eventually emerge. We will know God's will in time. But he was very reticent to say, uh, I know God's will. So back and forth, these two historians kept going. More recently, um, a new thesis has emerged by Mark Knoll in a book called America's God. And Knoll's thesis is this dilemma between the Puritan mother and the rationalist mother got resolved on the frontier. Because on the frontier, it, um, life was hard. And the only churches that were gonna make it on the church, uh, on, on the frontier, were the churches that knew 
how to, uh, as Noel says, slim down. So they gave up many of the assumptions of their mother churches. They gave up any notions of Christendom. They gave up any sense of an entitlement or, or a privilege from the government. And they knew that they were going to make it out on the frontier. They had to make it on their own. So they maintained four basic uh, commitments, no claims. And any church that maintained these four basic commitments did just fine on the frontier. One of them was the Bible. The second was conversion. The third one was mission or activism. And the fourth one was the cross. Bible, conversion, activism, cross. Everything else is negotiable. That's the way life works on the frontier. Life is hard out there. Uh, you've got to make it clean, you've got to make it clear uh, if you're going to attract your people. And it's got to be a message that will appeal to their own need for a heroic faith. Now the advantage to this is that, Mark uh, Noel says, is that it put the <coughs> churches on the frontier in a competitive situation. Not all the churches were going to make it, and those who knew how to slim down to these four basic things Bible, conversion, uh, mission, and cross, they were the ones who made it. The ones who tried to drag some of the affections of Christendom along with them, they didn't do so well on the frontier. Now the exception to this would be those who maintained an ethnic identity. So the Lutheran church did well wherever it went, as long as everybody stayed together, it was all German, and spoke the German language and worship, for example. So with the exception to that, the frontier churches that did well slimmed down. disadvantage of that is that there are things that are lost if those are only four things. Bible, conversion, mission, and cross. Where, for example, is sacraments? And Noel said, it, he said, I'm all for the sacraments. I'm just telling you, it didn't work on the frontier. <laughs> that, just, that, wasn't, that wasn't what worked. And his thesis goes on to say, even after the frontier was settled, the mentality remained. Uh, and this necessarily uh, competitive environment on the frontier was pushed upon them by this conflict because the state wasn't going to help them out on the frontier. They were going to make it, they were going to make it on their own. There was no mother church back in Germany that was going to help them either. They were on their own. This is what they learned they had to do to make it. When they did make it and the frontier was settled, the mentality remained. And they thought of these four basic kinds of things as what is necessary to grow the church. And the church grew by slimming down, not by being sacramental. As he pushes his thesis a little bit more, he then says, however, once the churches over the years became more settled and secure, then they began to miss the sacraments. And they began to miss nice church buildings. And they began to miss beautiful hymns and pipe organs. So they would reach back to the old traditions and try to get this more sacramental experience. Uh, what do you think he's drawing from is Jonathan Edwards has, and with this I'll stop, uh, Jonathan Edwards has this tension. He's, he's, he was very worried about the American church's ability to maintain the tension between the instrumental and the sacramental. So the church has to always have both. By sacraments, he doesn't just mean communion and baptism. He means an experience of the presence of God. By the instrumental, he means that it's activism. So the church needs to have both, a sense of its mission, its activism, its call, doing what it takes to proclaim Jesus in the land, and, and the kingdom of God, but also to provide a, a sense of the experience, uh, an encounter with the experience of God. And his worry was that the American church was always going to lean towards the instrumental for the sake of its survival, because it didn't have the protection of the state because of these guys to simply rest in the sacramental. And I think some, some have started to speculate in history, you can see a swing back and forth, that the church gets very, very instrumental. We see this in Presbyterianism. We get very, very instrumental, we grow, we grow, we grow. And then the ministers start wearing stoles and we start putting crosses up in our churches. We get raise money for back, for uh, pipe organs and uh, <laughs> bugs too, yes. And, um, and, because we want an experience in worship. And then we realize that the church is in decline and so all the conversation now is what do we have to do to help the church grow again, which is instrumental language. And we don't, we've always had, as Presbyterians, a difficult time maintaining this tension. So I, my point in this presentation is simply to say, this is the surrounding American environment. 
uh, historically in which we have, <laughs> in all of 40 minutes, uh, in which we have functioned, and we are no different than the other churches of the country who've had to participate in this tension between having a covenant of responsibility and inability to fully uh, uh, succeed with that, uh, an expectation that we will present our, our convictions rationally when those convictions are not discerned rationally, they're discerned supernaturally. So these are some of the tensions that we've lived with as have the other churches and in, the, and in Noel's thesis is the frontier is the best way of resolving it. So as you said, you're on your own. And that's kind of, he says it's created an American religious mentality. Yeah. <laughs> if you'll be gentle, I'll take questions. <laughs> and considering the believer or the potential believer being able to read the Bible for himself was a core part of their idea of evangelizing from the very beginning, I mean, going back to Europe, correct? I mean, we, we see that link between the literacy and the Bible. Um, and the, the, I believe the continuing uh, faith of, that developed in America was very convinced that without the individual having the right to interpret scripture for themselves in context of consensus among believers was essential to the separatist point of view. And sometimes it's thought of that the, right, that the ability to read was part of the more establishment. Here's what the Bible says, this is what we tell you it says, and you read it for yourself and then you'll be convinced. I mean, there are different ways to look at the reading element. Right. But the, the emphasis on the Bible is means reading the Bible by each believer because the laity is so important. <coughs> Would you, can you comment on that just a little bit about how? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, don't know, I don't want to push this thesis too far, but these people would say, we teach them to read the Bible so they know how to read. And therefore they are made more rational because they're educated and they can think the Bible is a great mechanism for teaching them how to read. These people would say we teach them to read the Bible so they can read the Bible and therefore know what to do. It's two dramatically different uh, rationales for literacy. And, and, and the churches, different churches have different rationales for Bible readers. You don't really think I need this, David, do you? Um, thanks. Um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Beatwood. Could you, would you do me a favor as a, a, I'm just a layman, would you define conversion, please? And then I have a second part to the question. Well, conversion typically refers to a, um, a phenomenon in one person's life, in which they cease being a non-Christian, they then become a Christian. And sometimes it's an intellectual event, sometimes, more often, in fact, it's uh, an event filled with quite a bit of emotion. But the decision, to, um, so these people would say it's a decision to let Jesus Christ be your Lord and, and the Savior of your life. These people would say you're converted actually through a, you know, an ongoing process of uh, rational, clear thinking. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I'm glad to know I'm converted. Um, so, I know what you're rolling on the floor. <laughs> so, so secondly, secondly, you said, if I understood it right, that the Puritans were going to do whatever they could to grow their church, right. including military force. Sure, absolutely. So you're going out to make people convert? Do I understand that correctly? I mean, isn't conversion by definition something that you do because you want to do it? Right. That gets us back to the inverted era. Like, just because they subjugated the people, that means they're here. So when they're trying to expand the borders of the land, they're just trying to take control of, of, of the people of that particular land. Then comes the preaching, and then comes the invitation to conversion. So the, 
to move them here to here to here. They can't make somebody Christian. The Christians never thought they could do that. But they could expand the borders of the colony, which would give them more mission field than to talk to. <clears throat> You're speaking of, of differences that are substantial, fundamental. Uh, but within the Presbyterian Church, we have apparently two very different parts of the church. Are they related to these things you're discussing? Oh, absolutely. You find this alive and well today within the Presbyterian Church. There are Presbyterians who really lean this way. You know, it's about a personal experience with Jesus Christ as your Savior. Uh, when we enter into debates at Presbytery, you know, to the, uh, there's going to be somebody who's going to say, but this is just God's will. Why are we even debating this? Um, and then you have people on this side who are trying to create rational arguments as to why it's this way, it can't be that way, and why it's this way, it can't be that way. By the way, even in the Presbyterian Church, progressives can end up on this side of other things too, by virtue of their own experience, and God has told them something that's very different than what God may have told the very conservative Christians. It's a kind of a way of thinking, is my point. And they're both alive and well in the Presbyterian Church. I, I didn't have anywhere near enough time to get into the modernist fundamentalist debates, but holy cow, does that show up? Yeah. Well, You left out uh, an important element in, in Christian faith and uh, as the Puritans understood it, namely human sin. Uh, the, the, the question uh, the the basis for uh, the freedom of religion is that no one understands Christ well enough to dominate others, uh, either well enough or powerful enough. The misuse of power was the basic reason uh, uh, for the the uh, 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 for, for for the Treaty of Westphalia, which brought about uh, freedom, uh, brought about relativity of religion. <laughs> The question is, do you believe in freedom, uh, in, in, in reason as the basis of American society? Or if not, what do you believe? <laughs> let, me, let me start with sin. OK, I believe in that. Um, the, uh, the, I didn't mean to leave that out of the, of the notion of the Puritan. Uh, understand conversion. That's why there's so much uh, anxiety. They were anxious over their sin. Uh, they were anxious over being stuck along the way in the journey, even after their conversion. It's a little despondency for that. Uh, they're very clear. Puritans are very clear about, about sin. And conversion doesn't doesn't free you from sin, but it gives you a means of dealing with your sins. Um, in terms of the power issues, these people are much more worried about power issues than these people. Uh, that's why they disestablished religion, because they had seen what had happened uh, in Europe. And they see how religion, that when this goes unchecked, particularly when it becomes competitive with other religions, power gets used in very, very uh, deadly ways. So these folks are very concerned about power, and their hope is that, maybe we would say naive hope, is that if people are rational, well, we won't resort to violence. I don't think the last 200 years of history have proven that that hope is going to actually I remember uh, John Dewey, clearly on this side, uh, way maybe on this side, uh, <laughs> John Dewey felt that the problem wasn't that we had sin or evil, what we had was a lack of education. And that if you educate the masses, which was a radical idea, 
you educate the masses, you'll get rid of social ill. So in the portals of all of these uh, colleges all over the country is you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. They're not, they're not talking about the Gospel of John. Uh, it's John Dewey. <laughs> That's what they're talking about. Because Dewey was the one who got that phrase going. You'll know the truth and the truth will free you from social evil. That's what he meant. So if we just educate the masses, we can get rid of social evil. Well, we've had a whole lot of really educated people do some really bad stuff. <laughs> so I don't think anybody really hangs to that. Please join me again in thanking Dr. Barnes. stick around, have some small discussions, and um, you know, talk about some of the things you've heard before you leave. So again, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.